Hey folks, thanks for listening to the Get a Grip on Life podcast. Hey, on today's show, I have Jamie Alcroft. We're going to get into it with him real soon. But for right now, remember, if you want to create your own podcast or you want to do some digital media for your corporation or your company or whatever, go to getagripstudios.com, son. That's right. Go there right now. (laughs) Start a podcast. Welcome to the Get a Grip on Life show, Jamie Alcroft. Uh, thanks, Mike. It's it's great to be here. I've, I've just got to go start my own podcast right now. <laughs> go to getagripstudios.com, <laughs> Jimmy. Like I'm going to go to get a grip. Absolutely. Yeah. I just do what you tell me. <laughs> you know what? We're doing this show. The reason I'm doing this show is is kind of get the idea out there. We, we have a couple of good clients actually that are using the studio. So it's been, it's been productive. Good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So tell me a little bit about the morning man. Like, I mean, I'm reading your, your bio here and it's, you get to this point, CH, I don't know where to start. Do we start with the organ <laughs> transplants or do we start with the, Sure. I, <laughs> it's like a, a wild. So you're, you're, you've received wild, a new, a new right. you've received a new heart and a new liver. I did. I did about a year and a half ago, September so, 24th, 2017. How long did you have to wait for that? I actually waited about. Uh, four months, but that's misleading because I was only on the list for a month. Huh. Uh, I was in the hospital and they were keeping me alive for three months. And then I finally got on the list. I mean, to get on the list is a big deal. You have to be sick enough to get on the list. And I got sick enough. So I got on the list and I waited only 30 days, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah. I usually hear people a wait lot of years. Of- Oh, well, not years, but certainly months and months. And some people do wait, you know, a year and a half or or, or something like that. I know a woman who's waiting uh, six years for a kidney now, and she's she's a little tired. She she needs a new kidney. Um, and, and that's really the problem down here in the States. And uh, I think uh, the similar problem in Canada, although I don't know the statistics for Canada, but I do know that only 56 percent of us down here our donors. And um, I was laying in bed and I started reading about it uh, when I was waiting for my heart. And uh, I discovered that uh, 20 people a day die because the organs they need aren't available. Hmm. And that really bothered me. So that's when I started writing. And I started writing these little uh, entries on uh, Facebook every day. And I call them the Tin Man Diaries mm-hmm. uh, because I was the Tin Man. I was waiting for a heart, sure. and um, and it caught on. And people said, "Gee, this is really funny. This is really good stuff. You're taking us on your journey with you." Uh, and uh, heck, we're enjoying it. So keep going. So I just kept writing, and every few days when I'd have the strength, I'd uh, sit at my computer and write out a a little travel log of what had happened to me over the last two or three days. And, you know, the doctors and the nurses, they were just doing their job and they're just trying to keep me alive, but they were so funny. Just (laughs) the stuff they did and the ways they screwed up. It was hilarious. It was just really great. Tell me they didn't screw up when they had your chest open and you're removing one heart and putting another in. did not. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happens with that is um, the policy down here is that the actual surgical team has to fly to or go to wherever the donor hospital is and examine the the organs before they fly them back in a cooler to throw into me. So they were responsible for those organs from the get-go, but they procured them from the donor uh, who was dead and uh, has to be brain dead. It has to be... uh, approved by two doctors that aren't involved in the case at all. They have to be two doctors that just come out of nowhere, basically, and they're neurosurgeons, and they have to uh, confirm that the patient is brain dead, and that's when they can take their organs, you know, as long as the family approves and, and the person has filled out a donor card. Let me, so let me, filling out a donor card, becoming a donor is a very, very important legacy in life because I don't know who this guy was, but I call him Brian, and I thank him every day. I want to ask you: Do you do you know what this who this person was? Do you know his history? Do you know his family? I just know that it was well, it was a motorcycle accident, and um, which is typical. The, actually, the the surgeons call them donor cycles because they have so many motorcyclists that uh, end up 
on the table donating their organs. That's wow. just uh, just the way it is. It's just a, <laughs> you get on a motorcycle and you just increased your chances of being a donor uh, exponentially. Yeah, you know that. You know so, it's interesting. It's interesting that there's um, if you want to avoid tragedy in life, there's a few things that you shouldn't do. Um, I agree. One of them is use ladders a lot. <clears throat> use ladders in the rain. Yeah. Oh no, or, there's different. Yeah, use there's frozen. Yeah, there's or use like, frozen ladders. Yeah. No, I mean if, ladders if in general. If yeah, just in general. It's ladders are killers, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. motorcycles, and, ladders. There's um. A bunch of different things that is people do every day. There is a, there is a list of things that you yeah. cannot do that will reduce yeah. your, like that will will significantly reduce your risk of becoming, say, an order donor or getting seriously hurt. Like people get mm -hmm. hurt every day on ladders, every single day. Yeah, sure. You know, motorcycles I, I and ladders. Ended up in the hospital with, on a ladder, and also do not uh, pet bison. That's a, that's a that's good a good one too. Yeah, sure. Yes, don't try to pet bison. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Uh, maybe uh, not ride bulls. Go, uh, live bulls. And if you're going to go Riding skydiving, uh, pack a, a parachute, for goodness sake. That's a good sake. idea. You never know if you're going <laughs> to need it or not. Well, let me yeah. ask you a couple yes. questions seriously about organ donation. So I am not an organ yeah. donor. Oh, I my have goodness. not filled not? out my card. I don't know. I'm this. I, I, I look at it every time I renew my license. You renew it every five years or whatever, and you get that option on your driver's right. license. And I'm just like, <sighs> No, I don't want to do it. I don't know why. I know. Isn't that awful? I don't know why either. Let, let, me, let me pose this case to you. Let me posit this. Posit uh, That um, each of us wants to make a difference, I think, by being here. I, sure. I know I've always wanted to make a difference by being here on this earth. And um, I've wanted to make other people's lives better as well mm -hmm. as my own. And by making other people's lives better, I certainly increase the value of my own life and, sure. and uh, spiritually grow. Uh, so imagine the legacy that you leave. Uh, this was a 46 year old motorcyclist who had filled out his donor card and he might have just gone up to the 7-Eleven for a loaf of bread or something. And on his way back, he never made it. Uh, but his organs have given life to eight people, his skin mm -hmm. tissue, his corneas can give life to hundreds of people and enhance the lives of burn victims, uh, give sight to the blind. And that's why people say to me, oh, I'm too old. They don't want my work. <laughs> They're all messed up. I've abused myself. Well, be that as it may, uh, the doctors love old skin tissue because it stretches over the burn victim skin tissue much better than young skin tissue. Uh, you're not old enough yet, but you'll reach an age where you take your socks off at night and then you go to bed. You wake up the next morning and the imprint of your socks is still on your legs. That's when you know you're aging. And that's when you know your skin tissue is huh. in really great shape because that's the kind of skin tissue they want. My donor was 46. I'm going to be, uh, I'm 70. So I'm 46 going on 70. I don't know whether to have a midlife crisis or get a reverse mortgage. <laughs> I am so conflicted. I just don't know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, I go around speaking to groups and I'm speaking to you right now. Sure. And I would encourage you to fill out that donor card. Uh, matter of fact, you can go online and fill it out right now and become a donor and leave a legacy. Uh, someday, someone somewhere might be saying, wow, you know, I don't know the guy, but I know his name was Mike and he gave me his heart and I'm alive today. I can see my daughter get married. I can hold my new grandchild in my hand. I can see my other daughter perform at Staples Center and see her on the cover of, of Billboard magazine this month. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if it hadn't been for someone taking the simple action of filling out that donor card, taking two minutes, three minutes, and giving life to eight people and enhancing the lives of over a hundred and giving sight to the blind. I have a friend who lives in Israel and uh, his daughter passed at 15 years of age and he donated uh, her organs and he met 
the people. The, the policy in Israel is a little different as far as donorship is concerned. But he actually met the old woman who was looking through his daughter's corneas. He met the little boy who happened to be Palestinian who had his daughter's kidneys. And being a Jew uh, in, in Israel and giving kidneys to a Palestinian was a big deal. And wow, what a wonderful, universal way of showing your love and leaving a legacy. You leave that legacy and, and they might not even know your name. They might not have known your face, but that life has been given and you gave it. And I don't know, that's pretty special for a couple of minutes of filling out your donor card. And look at it this way, Mike, when you're an organ donor, you're not going to know it. <laughs> yeah, you're, I mean, you're really not going to go. You're not going to go through any pain or anything uh, mm. You're going to be gone. But you can I can, can I can, can I can I I'm not saying that I disagree with anything. Sure, what no, you said, please, can please, I no. Can I throw some antithesis on advocate. the table here? Yeah, be a devil's advocate. Sure. So, you know, when I when I think about it, I just look at myself on that table um, mm -hmm. you know, apparently I'm brain dead, right? Which is what the neurosurgeons are, are concluding. You have to be. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. And then there's these doctors waiting to take me all apart and send different yeah. parts of me all over the, you know, all over. Like I wouldn't want my eyes to be in someone else's body. I don't know about my eyes. Why? I don't know. Like my eyes are special to me. Like you're that, not going to need them where you're, know, where you're going. But I want to. I know wherever you're going. You're not but I feel need like I, I, just, like I, I, I'm not as entirely filled with joy. And I, I mean, when I think mm -hmm. of the Palestinian kid and getting those kidneys, yeah, that's a nice story. I'm not saying that that's bad or anything like that. Um, but for me, it's like when I think about my organs and my kidneys, it's like I feel like I, I want to be buried as a whole person. I don't know if I want to, I don't know okay. if I, that, that's, that's my struggle. It's like, I feel like and, and, when I die and this is partial, I, I agree with everything you've said. Don't take me the wrong way here. But, and I, I, and I, I I'm you. not against owner donorship, but, but that's why it's a choice, right? That, that's mm -hmm. why it is a choice. Absolutely. Right. So people like, there's something about it that maybe I feel like my eyes are sacred and my heart is sacred, but I think I would be okay with my kidneys and my liver my skin maybe parts of my skin or whatever i don't know okay i don't know let me play devil's advocate what sure. do you mean by sacred like to me it's my heart and i want it to be with me like i i'm a i'm a spiritual person i'm a christian i believe okay. that when i die that um i'm that that's not it there's more to the life right There's that, that will my continue. spirit, spirit will, continue. will continue yeah i believe Good. that 100 percent. and um you know, to me, there's certain organs of mine that are sacred that I, I wouldn't want. Yeah, no, seriously, that I wouldn't want. I'm, other I'm people sure. I'm not, I, don't, I mean, don't laugh. I, I shouldn't be laughing. No, laugh. I mean, it, maybe it is funny. Maybe it is Go funny. Ahead. But I mean, uh, like to me, I don't know. I just that, that's the problem with it. If they could give me a list of which organs I want to donate and which ones I don't, I'd be more comfortable. In Ontario, that is the case. It is the case? Yeah. Yeah, okay. it is. You, you can you can actually specify uh, down here as well. You can specify uh, what organs you may or may not want to donate. Uh, you know, the great thing about organ donorship is uh, they can take everything and you can still be in your casket and look like you had just died. I mean, there's you can have an open casket uh, yeah. being a donor, being a sure. complete donor. You can still have an open casket. Uh, that is it. I don't know why you're going to need your eyes where you're going. I know. Uh, I, I agree people, with you. People who think that we're going to fly around in the clouds with wings on, they might think they need their bodies, but they're not going to need their organs necessarily. Yeah. Uh, as long as you've got a back, you can attach those wings to it. <laughs> you're fine. You're, you're off. You're off and running, man. Yeah, but I, 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 and, think, I think and that... I guess, I guess Okay, go ahead. I, I think that, you know, if you really want to reach people, in a sense, I think that 
It's important to respect these kind of concerns, though. I do respect that. And I'm sorry if I'm... No, no, no. Bad. I'm not saying you haven't. I, I just think... I think that mention. there's like people on either... So you have people like, for example, I think Bob Marley died because he wouldn't have a blood transfusion or something like that, right? So there's people that are right. against medical interventions, various types right. of medical interventions for religious or spiritual reasons. That's their choice, right? That's their or, choice. I can't talk them out of that. For, for sure. Whatever their thinking is, as wrong as I think that thinking might be, there's right. really no right and wrong when it comes to that, because this is your own personal choice. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I so would never try to. I, I'm only. I'm not trying to talk you into it, Mike. I'm merely trying to present my case. So to yeah, speak, yeah, yeah. I hear because you. I'm sitting here alive because someone. Yeah, had yeah. You're. Compassion. You're. It's really a miracle. Like when you think about it. It is. Like, it's amazing. If if that's not a miracle. If you if people think oh no it's it's science or whatever right okay great it's science but I mean you know they take the heart out they plug it into the ventricles or whatever and they cauterize those right. things and and then they I'm sure do you have to take some medication to stop your body from attacking those organs or anything like that or is it I just do now up? I'm um, my immune system they depress your immune system mm -hmm. uh, so that your body won't reject the organs they're always afraid of rejection and i'll have to take anti-rejection drugs all my life but what they didn't realize was i've been an actor for 40 years mm -hmm. i thrive on rejection <laughs> that's what i live for <laughs> every day i go out and i get rejected <laughs> that's funny so the that's so true. but it's if you true. think about and, it like your your heart if you touch your heart right now and you feel it beating that's another man's heart that's in your body or another woman, it's a man, that's right? right? That's, that's right. incredible to me, man. Like it, that's- It that's... is incredible to me too. And it's incredible because I am a, a, an advocate. I'm an, actually an ambassador for One Legacy, which is the organization that finds the organs and finds the recipients for the organs of people that need it. Um, so I go around speaking to people, but I get together and we have meetings at One Legacy and there are as many recipients at these meetings as there are donors and donor families. Mm. The donor families come because they know that their son or brother or father is living on through someone else. And they have actually pressed their heads and their ears next to that person's chest mm. and heard their loved one's heart beating in someone else's chest. And it's a very moving experience. I bet it is, that's gotta and be if, incredible. If that isn't a spiritual experience, if that isn't the work of God, then I don't know what is. Mm. And I guess that's why I am such an advocate for donorship. <laughs> well, I'm alive, that's why I'm an advocate sure. for donorship. Sure. But uh, but also I, I, I see this, I witness this, on a, a weekly basis uh, at the meetings. And um, it is, I, I don't think I've gone to a meeting yet where I haven't cried, mm. where I haven't been reduced to the emotion of, of life, mm. the emotion of death, the emotion of new life, uh, the emotion of through death, receiving life. Um, to me, uh, that's a very, very spiritual thing. I, I always taught my kids to spell God with two O's. Mm. So live like God, live for good. And the goodness of God certainly is at work when we see these miracles, when human beings possess the knowledge uh, and the power and the technical uh, apparatus, uh, the medical machines that they have. I mean, they, they basically, when they took my heart out, they cut all the nerves out and then they hooked me up to a machine that was keeping me alive. What a miracle that was oh, to begin that's with. Incredible, a machine yeah. that's keeping me alive. And it kept me alive until they could take that new heart, that 46 year old heart and put it in my 70 year old body. And the doctor said, as soon as he stitched it in, he put two stitches in the artery and my heart started beating. He didn't, sometimes they have to use paddles 
but my heart was so shock happy it. to be there. Huh. And, and yeah, they had to shock it. They had to boom. But yeah. they didn't with my heart. They sewed it in. It just started clicking away there. Yeah. And it was happy. And it, I also got a liver because over 15 years, my heart had beat up on my liver. And I had what they call heart induced cirrhosis, which shocked me. I said, Well, I could have drank more. You're kidding me. <laughs> and I felt unnecessarily sober at the time. But uh, that's what happened. So I needed a heart and liver. And when you do get a dual transplant, it tends to be more successful and more vibrant than a single because the organs have a relationship. I know sure that they sounds do. odd. It's that weird, eh? Yeah. But they've been, isn't that weird? They've been working together all those years and they yeah, have He's got a buddy. He's got a buddy. In the there. Sim yeah. Hey, it's you, man. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> hey. I'm all right. Hey, pump that blood in here. I'm going to clean it out. Okay? This place is all right, man. This place, he's an old dude, but he's all right. <laughs> yeah. He's, so it's, that's funny. golly, uh, I, I cannot tell you what a, a miracle I have lived through. And that's mm. why I wrote my book, The Tin Man Diaries, mm. uh, because it was cathartic. I had to share this miracle with as many people as possible. And, and I talked about, you know, a lot of people talk to me about religion and spiritualism sure. and, and so forth and uh, the ramifications of that. And honestly, I just felt so blessed to have um, been in control enough to know I was sick and go to the doctor. Well, I went to the doctor. I took control of my life. I had control over that. But as soon as he said, you need a new heart, I let go. I just, I just zoned out. I just owned out and I let go because I knew I was going to be in the hands of experts and I knew there was nothing I could do to affect the outcome. Nothing. Uh, when I, when I go through things in life and I know that I can affect the outcome, um, rather than hope or pray or wish, I take action. I do something about it because I have the power to do something about it. But when something is out of my hands, I really let it go. And it relieves the stress. Uh, it relieves all of the worrying and the fretting that you might, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh my God, what am I going to do? Well, you have no control. Mm. As some people might say, as you might say, it's in God's hands. As I might say, it's, it's the fate. It's, what is going to happen is going to happen. And, you know, this heart that I'm receiving from a donor is made of carbon and tissue and may have at one time been a tree. You know, not that person was a tree, but sure. the carbon that makes up the tissue, that makes up the heart, that makes up the ventricles and everything. Yeah, there's something ventricles. beyond fate. Once there's something beyond fate. There's something beyond fate that you're talking about. And what is that? It's like the that intervention is beyond fate. So you were fated to yeah, pass away. The intervention was. But once I got to yeah. the point where it was out of my control, yeah. I really ha had the ability because of the way I thought and, and, and the, the, what I believe in. I let go of that and I put it into the hands of God or fate yeah. or Buddha or how long have you been? How, how long ago did you have the surgery to, for the new heart and liver? Uh, it was a year and a half ago. Year and a half ago. Wow. Yes, sir. Yeah. Wow. And, huh. um, and I feel, I feel great. I honestly, Mike, within six months, I felt better than I had in 20 years Interesting, because I had a heart that was functioning and pumping. And I could I could walk three blocks and not have huh. to stop six times to catch my breath. And that was the difference. My my heart was really bad. Huh. It really had failed. And I was born with what they call um a a weak uh left descending artery. And that results in a heart attack that they call the widowmaker. What happens is you're born with a weak artery wall. And at one point in your life, usually when you're in mid sixties, early or mid fifties, early sixties, that explodes. The, 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 the weak part of your artery bursts 
and your body says, oh my gosh, that's a heart attack. I'm going to plug up whatever's causing the problem. It sends all the plaque in your body to that hole in your artery. And at that point, you have what they call a widow maker and you're supposed to drop dead. I was very fortunate. I did not drop dead. I was on an airplane at 30,000 feet flying from Seattle to Los Angeles. And uh, I had symptoms. I was one out of four to have symptoms. And it, but it did so much damage to my heart that I lived for the next 12 years quite compromised. Mm. And then when my health got bad enough that I needed a new heart, uh, I accepted it gratefully. I just said, okay, I'm gonna go through this experience I don't know what it's going to be like, but oh my gosh, I'm getting a heart transplant. How many people get to live through that? Yeah, How crazy. many people get to experience that? And not many. I know they did at the hospital that I went to, Cedar Sinai in, in Beverly Hills, which is uh, the most successful or, or at least renowned uh, transplant hospital in the world. Um, that's where I went to Cedar Sinai and where they took great care of me and I just, I surrendered to them. I totally surrendered to it and just oh. was very lucky. And, 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 you know, and I tried to laugh about it and, and, and in my book, I, I write, you know, they say, Oh, your book's so funny and laughter's the best medicine. Well, I, I gotta tell you, whoever said laughter's the best medicine has never had a morphine drip. <laughs> can't be, can't be. Yeah, I can. I, I I bet you know it's. Uh, yeah, there's something to that um, that morphine that makes people feel real good. I bet eh? the uh, well, it was the hallucinations. They get you get hallucinations when you're under the morphine, and I would wake up from my hallucinations and I'd write them down immediately. So all my hallucinations are in the book, and huh. they were they were morphine induced, and they were pretty spectacular. And uh, I, you know. I don't know how to, all, all I can do is give people facts and all I can do is tell people about the experiences that I've had. I can't tell you that you should be a donor uh, yeah. because that is truly, truly personal. And uh, that's between you and uh, whoever your spiritual being might be, or whoever, whatever you have over the years about the kind of person you are. If you, if you want that, if you want to be buried with your eyes, then you should certainly stipulate that you want to be buried with your eyes. And, uh, and you will be. You know, they, they take care of that. You know, if you have organs and you're willing to part with them uh, after you don't need them anymore, then uh, after you've passed from this, this human life, Mm -hmm. This body that we live in, and we pass on to a spiritual life. Uh, you're not going to need the organs, so why not let somebody live a little bit longer just to to hold that grandbaby, you know, and and to do stand up. I'm still doing stand up. I'm still getting up and doing stand up every once. You know, I started. You, I'll tell you, yuck yucks. Yeah, there's nothing that scares <laughs> me more. Like, okay, so I'm very, I'm a good public speaker. I have no yes. issue uh, with public speaking. But there's something about stand up which is absolutely terrifying to me. Like oh, stand up no. stand up comedy is yeah. is probably you know how some a lot of people are afraid of you know being in front of crowds or public speaking and all that. Stand up comedy, sure. if that's a spectrum, stand up comedy has to be at the furthest end of that spectrum. Really? Huh. I think it's I super just... scary for most people to go up there, okay, now you gotta make everybody laugh. Go. That's pretty tough, man. Well, well, there, there's the mindset right there, Mike, is you don't have to make everybody laugh. I think you go up on stage, at least I have gone up on stage, with the mindset that I know something and I have something to share that nobody else out there in the audience has or knows. Mm -hmm. And it gives me a, a comfort zone when I go up there because I'm, I'm sharing with them and it may be something that they've thought of, uh, because certainly comic it, com comedy is relatable. It's a relatable art form. You have to relate 
to what you're laughing at. It's the truth that you like laugh at it. And um, it's with like with any art form, you might look at a modern painting and say, hey, no, I don't, I don't get that. That's not me. I don't sure. get that. Just like you might be in an audience and say, that guy's not funny or that woman's not funny. Um, but I, when I started off at Yuck Yucks uh, in 1981, there was a young fellow there named Jim Carrey who opened for us. And uh, we were Mac and Jamie. We were the never heard of Mac and Jamie. Ne never heard of Jim Carrey. <laughs> uh, no. Well, I'm he joking. speaks very highly of you. Is that right? He speaks very highly of you. Yeah, he does. That's surprising. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, yeah. But he, he started off, and boy, he was just brilliant. He did that uh, Catherine Hepburn, Henry Fonda on Golden Pond sketch, and just killed. Just, and, and his comedy at the time was, uh, had a lot of pathos to it as well. And uh, he was a tough act to follow. I bet. We were the headliners, but yeah, we had to work with that crowd to get them, to get them going. I well, went Mark to see Breslin on Yuck Yuck Sennets. He might still. My, uh, my yeah, wife yeah. took me to a comedy show, a uh, British guy recently, Michael. I can't remember his last name. Very funny, though. But you know what I noticed about it? There, when I was, um, because I speak for a living now, so I have a, like a podcast that I do that I, get, that I actually get paid for, which is interesting. And, Ooh, wow. but, what, but what I noticed, what I notice in good conversations with people is there's kind of a cadence to it. Right. And then when I was watching yes. this guy deliver his comedy routine, I kind of watched it from a professional perspective to see the spectacle. Like, how is he going to do this? So, you know, you're paying a lot of money to watch this very famous comedian. He better make you laugh. Right. So what mm -hmm. happened was first he had someone come out and kind of warm up the crowd. Right. Sure. And I, that was the first thing I noticed. And the guy that came out was a professional for sure. I don't know if he was a local comedian or not, but he came out. He got everyone kind of laughing. And then this other comedian came out and there was a, there was almost like a rhythm or a cadence to when he would deliver his jokes. Am I, am I making mm -hmm. sense here? He kind of yeah, had absolutely. this like flow going with the absolutely. crowd where he would hold mm -hmm. longer than you expected him to hold, or he would deliver a joke at a timing you weren't ready for or something. But overall there was like this flow to this hour long performance where basically he had the whole crowd in stitches at the end of the whole thing. And I wonder is, is there, are comedians aware of that? Am I talking crazy or is there, is there really a no, cadence no, 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 to no. comedy? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're very aware of that. Oh, okay. And, and the best, the better comedians are the ones that have the better timing. I worked with another nice. fellow on stage. So being part of a comedy duo, the timing was essential and our mm -hmm. delivery was essential. And once you learn when to hit them with the button, when to hit them with the punchline, when to get the callback, uh, all these things that make up stand up comedy, even if you don't know the name for them, you learn them. Sure. The audience shows you the way. The audience will always tell you what's funny and what's not funny. And they'll always show you the way to your timing as well. And uh, that's why it's always important to record your shows. Because you're not recording the shows to hear you. You're recording the shows to hear the audience. Interesting. Because they tell you what's funny. They tell you where your timing should be. They, it's, it's an exciting art form in, in that way or performance art form. Um, and it's, it's risky as well. And you got to take chances. You have to put your neck out there on the chopping block and let the audience have at it. Sure. And they'll tell you and show you what's funny. And the next time you get up on stage, you can try that joke again, but if it's not funny the second time, it's out of the act. There's a great book. If you're interested in public speaking, uh, written by a friend of mine, Rich Scheidner. It's called Kicking Through the Ashes. And he wrote it and it's about his rise to what he considers to be a mediocre level of comedy. He never <laughs> became a big star. But amongst comedians, if you say the word Rich Scheidner, there's a silence that falls over the room because the man is brilliant. He is so good at what he does. He just never got that sitcom. 
or never, and now he's retired in North Carolina, living happily. Mm. And, um, but it's a wonderful book to read because it talks about all that stuff, Mike, that, that you brought up, the, uh, the, the timing and the rhythm. Uh, and, and he is a master at it, he really is. Yeah, it's almost as if a good comedian is pushing the laugh button on you. And if you were to take out what they were saying and just listen to the sounds and the crests, there's something to the delivery and the intonation and the pitch that's happening mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. as important, I think, as the words the co comedian is saying. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. I find that fascinating in the art. When you're writing jokes, okay, so you're you're writing jokes and, and um, are you writing jokes off stage, writing things down, then trying them out on friends, and then maybe trying them out on a crowd? What's the process of coming putting together an act? If I think of something, I, I thought of something funny to say uh, a few weeks ago. And I tried it out on a couple of friends and they laughed. Huh? And then I took it on stage and it got a laugh. And now that line is part of my act. Um, I make uh, being 70, I, a lot of my stuff is about being an older guy. And mm -hmm. uh, so I walk up on stage and I might walk slowly, more mm -hmm. slowly than the other comedians who bounded up on stage. Sure. And I'm walking slowly because I'm setting up my first line which is, whew, that was a long walk. <laughs> yeah. That's exhausting. But I'm here now. Uh, forgive me, I've, I've recently been diagnosed with early onset rigor mortis. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that gets the laugh. But I've learned that I have to push early onset, take a beat, and then say rigor mortis. If I said I've recently been diagnosed with early onset rigor mortis. Well, they're waiting for you to say job. diabetes or something like that, right? And and I've recently been diagnosed with early onset uh, rigor mortis. <laughs> yeah, you can even take a beat there. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Rigor mortis. You know, they're ex they're expecting di dementia or something like that. Uh, I think they are. I can't remember. But uh, nevertheless, you just you you learn that that cadence and. And now when I say that, I'll, I'll never do it with any other cadence other than the one that I used on stage. That got a laugh. Are you controversial? So you're quite right about that. Are you controversial at all? Are you controversial in your comedy? Like do you point out uh, uh, social issues? Do you poke fun at, you know, perhaps uh, something that's a very sensitive topic? I find that comedians are the best way for our culture to handle yes. and to, to release its tension over sensitive issues. To grow. Yes, I think it's to get past it's the best things. way for us to grow. I think it's the best way for us to grow. Absolutely. Because number one, you know, you think of all the TV commercials you've seen in your life, the ones that really sit with you, the ones you remember are the ones that were funny. Mm. Right. So sure. when, when you say something controversial, excuse me, controversial and funny, uh, you also have a responsibility, I think, as a comedian to make sure that what you're saying is either your truth or at least someone's truth. That, or um, the opposite, maybe. Or the complete, or the op opposite. Or the complete opposite. Complete opposite. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a, of a good example. Um, my partner and I used to do a a bit about how men should hug the okay. proper etiquette for men hugging like two men because hugging men or hugging, men hugging women men hugging men men okay. hug, men are hugging men more how about just not just not hug each other that's a good that's a good etiquette right there that's one way to do it you could totally avoid it but if you know there's nothing like a good hug really i don't so like to hug men to do a, S sorry you sorry, don't no nah, i'm not a man hug. my dad yeah sure but other yeah. than my dad i'm the hand and if they go for the hug, I keep the hand held and I do the back pat uh -huh. and that's it. <laughs> yeah, the back pat. Well, that was the hand bit. with the pull in and the back pat. Yeah. That's as far as I go with that's other men. That's what you did on stage. You know, yeah. the big, 
pat on the back. That's where yeah, we did. Yeah, hands and held. And the next thing. Boom, boom. There you go. The, the next thing. Good, good for you. Well, you're a real man. The, the, the way we <laughs> did it. Um, I, I, anyway, we did it on uh, a TV show that Rosie O'Donnell was hosting. Okay. And she accused us of being homophobic. And I said, you know, it's we're really not homophobic. We're up there hugging each other and showing other people how how men should hug. It, it doesn't feel homophobic to me. No. And but she pushed it. So that was probably one of the most controversial things we ever did. How men hug. You know, you know what the thing know, you, we need comedians like we it's like the you need the court jester that may be able to make fun oh, yeah. of the king. Right. We need people to tr like for me, this whole uh, gender f free bathrooms is something right. that a comedian really has to run with. Like somebody has somebody has to. Like people are so serious about what bathroom you're going to take a crap in. I mean, somebody's got to come up with a stand-up skit that just breaks everybody into stitches on that because it's. I know. Get a grip. Get uh, a grip. Yeah, I mean, you're, 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 you guys are arguing about bathrooms. I mean, you know, yes, it, you on. know, there's got to be a comedian that stands up, and I don't care what position he has on it or she has on it or something, but just really go after both sides of that argument and make everybody laugh and just relax a little bit because. There's so many things that get like in America right now, I think, and I think comedians cure this for us or bring us back. There's a real breakdown in the political compromise in the United States, you know, and there's a, and it's happening all over the place, but it's absolutely at its worst in Britain and the United States right now. It's a complete breakdown in right. the political compromise. The, the Democrats will not talk to the Republicans and there's just no sense. The comedians are what's going to bring those two idiots together. Like it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's so ridiculous. It's got to be funny in some senses, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. that comedians, when you start hearing about people, comedians getting shut down, that is like comic comedy is free speech. Like if there if there yes. isn't, it is the First Amendment, absolutely. No, but like being able to be a neo-Nazi or free whatever speech. is not free speech. Like that's hate speech, right? So if you're saying if you're a Holocaust denier and you're on a show, I don't know if we should really let people be hol. I, I, that's where I think maybe there is room for some laws. But if comedians are making people laugh about something, you got to leave that alone. You got to let them do that because it's very important that as a society to me that we exercise our ridiculousness through comedy. Yes, like, absolutely. I mean, we are. The Don Quixote de la Mancha. We hold the mirror exactly. up in front of society. Yes, yes. And we say, it's... "Look, this is you. How smart do you feel? How good do you feel about this? Because this is the way I see you. This is yes. the way you see yourself. This is what you're projecting to society." And it's funny it's... because it's true. That's why it's yeah. funny because it's true, yeah. right? That yeah, like, we... there's a sense of truth in comedy, like a deep uh reflective honesty when you're laughing at yourself at your own ridiculous behavior mm -hmm. in a sense sure it's beautiful dude it is. it's so important to uh to to uh, and i think that if if people were allowed to make jokes about these issues that we have in society it would really bring people back to the table okay we laughed about it it was funny both of us on both sides of this argument had a laugh about it and now we're going to yeah. discuss the issue seriously I think it's important. Yeah. I, I, I think it's way underestimated. I agree with you. In terms of its ability to unite people. Comedy can unite people, I totally, man. I totally agree. I, so many times uh, I would look out at the audience and I would see all of these people, 500 people, 300 people, 200 people, 60 people, it didn't matter. But they were all sharing a moment. Sure. They were sharing a laugh and they might not be able to share anything else in their lives. Yes. But they were able to share a laugh. They were able to. And I guess that's why we never or I never touch anything too controversial because uh, I'm not up there to make the audience feel uncomfortable with themselves. Sure. I get I'm up there to hold a mirror up to the audience and say, look, 
this is who I am. Are you like this too? Yeah, sure. Because if you are like this too, that's funny. You're you're screwed up or you're whatever. You're yeah. going the wrong way. You're. I mean, we do. I, I do a song. Uh, you know, every breath you take by Sting. Yeah, that's a creepiest you know? song of all time, by the way. Every speech you make, every <laughs> vow you break, every smile you fake, every bribe you take, we'll be watching you. Yeah, sure. Sing that to the politicians. Yeah, you know what? You, you, England, Canada, and United States. Yeah, it's it, and Mexico. Know, yeah, and and Mexico too, and the whole world, because there's something, there's something in in humor that breaks down barriers that I, I, I just don't think that uh, other mediums are as good at doing other than stand-up comedians. Oh, I agree with you. It's a total, it, it just breaks down those walls. It just, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Yeah, it if wouldn't be prudent. Tear down those walls not gonna do all it. the time. Not going to do it. You know, like, the, <laughs> not going to do it. That's wouldn't it be one. prudent. You know, uh, what's his name? Um, Dana Carvey doing uh, George H.W. Yeah. yeah. He was great. I yeah. mean, and you're watching that, and he's and the, the the country's at war, and here's this guy, you know, making fun of the president of the United States, and everybody's tensions relieved, and the people feel better That's about right. the situation. It's so important that comedians be afforded the well, ability. Well, I, do I that. don't know if you, Mike. I, I don't know if it makes one feel better about the situation, but it temporarily re, temporarily relieves the situation, the pressure, yeah, and relieves the tension. Um, I, I like to break tension whenever I can on stage. Sure. And um, it's, it, it, I've been, I've been really honored to be able to, for the last 40 years, make my living making people laugh. And now my daughter's out there and uh, she's a little pop star and she's, she's changing the world because she is a, a gay woman and she, has a big following in the LGBTQ, E I E I O L S M F T community. <laughs> uh, they're adding initials every day. So yeah, like that's something that has, but that's I'm something that has bases. to be, yeah, but that's something that has to be, that so obviously needs to be made fun of by comedians. Oh, sure, 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 sure. And it's not, it's not homophobic. And my daughter doesn't mind it, but the fact is, anyway, she has, she, uh, she has become a role model for young people who may be questioning their sexuality. Mm. And uh, so many people have killed themselves over the last few decades over their sexuality and their shame that society puts on them for being different. And I'm really proud of my daughter, uh, Haley Kiyoko, because she shows people that it's okay to be different. And she's had parents come up to her crying, saying, you saved my daughter's life because she saw your video, which is girls like girls like boys do. It's, I think it's got about 109 million views now. Mm -hmm. um, no, 190. Million so she's views. also Crazy. a comedian or she's... Um... No, she's a performer, a pop star. Okay. But she sings and she sings songs about women loving women. And so she has been able to make a difference in the world by showing these women that are questioning their sexuality that there are other people like them. When she was growing up, she had no role model. She had nobody to look to uh, and say, oh, there's somebody out there like me. But now she's creating that role model. Um, it's just like all these people that are speaking out of Megan Rapino from the uh, U.S. women's soccer team. She's taking a stand and she's saying, look, this is who I am. This is what I am. And it's OK. So um, I'm proud of my daughter for that. Uh, I hope that I've changed a few lives, uh, changed a few ways of thinking. Um, you're not going to change anybody's way of thinking, but you you might dig into their opinion a little bit uh, through your comedy and uh, I think that it's, I think that comedy it's a tough balance. I think when you make yeah, someone right. laugh at something, and you reduce yeah. the seriousness of it, it allows them to reflect on the issue and decide what they what it is, how they actually feel about it. I I, I think you and, can people change those minds, and they're laughing at themselves more often than not. Exactly. You know, 
you, you, you hold that mirror up and you say, look, this is what we are. This is what we're doing. Yeah. Isn't this ridiculous? Um, we make a big deal about how men hug and, and men feel awkward. So we're going to try to make you feel more comfortable about it. Um, what are some of the other things? Oh, what you've, you've talked a lot about changing people's minds. You talked about changing yeah. people's ideas about organ donation. You talked about changing people's ideas about um, lifestyle choices in terms of their sexuality. Lifestyle. What, yes. is, what, what has changed in you over the course of your 70 years? What, what ideas did you have that you had to leave behind, Jamie? That you had to say, you know what? I'm actually no longer in agreeing with that serious issue. I actually have come to take the other side. Are there any examples in your life where you've come around to new ideas? That's a great question, Mike. Um, because you're out there trying to convince I, people to change. So have you? No, I'm not trying to convince people. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to convince people to change. Uh, oh, oh, all I'm doing when I speak about donorship is I'm presenting the facts to people. And many people are shocked. In a convincing way. That 20, that 20 people a day die because the organs they need aren't available. Because... Our organ donorship rate is only 56% in the United States. You go to Denmark, you go to Spain, the organ uh, donorship rate over there is in the 70s, in the 70 percentile. And that's what I'm trying to get us to here in the United States, into the 70 percentile, where we're, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting to me because I speak to uh, what we call a rotary club down here. I don't know if you have that. Yeah, we have the rotary club, sure, yeah. Rotary International. Yeah. yeah okay. Sure. And I will say to a group like that, how many donors do we have in the audience? And about 90% of the, uh, the hands go up because these are people that have devoted their spare time to the Rotary Club, which helps others in need. So they are a compassionate group of people. They're people who care about humanity their own species and society, their community, enough to join a Rotary Club, raise money for a shelter or whatever it might be. Skate park, whatever, um, they're, whatever and, they're up to. Yeah. Whatever it might be. Sure. But those people, 90% of the hands pop up. If I go to a group that's just a random group, that um, say a city council meeting or something, sure. and I ask the same thing, only about a half of the hands go up because they are not Rotarians. They don't, um, they're not in the Lions Club or the Elks Club or uh, Doctors Without Borders or whatever philanthropic organizations may be out there. Uh, they may not belong to them. But those people that are in the philanthropic organizations, they're already giving. So they know about the donorship and how easy it is to just say, yeah, Okay, you can have them because I'm not going to need them. What ideas have you walked away from in your life that you previously held, though? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think probably the biggest one is marriage. Uh, when I was in 1971, when I was about 22, uh, I read an article about the rainforest and how the rainforest is being depleted in South America because of the cattle industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cattle industry encourages farmers to chop down their rainforest uh, and raise cattle. Mm -hmm. uh, so I stopped eating meat. And that was 1971. That was a long time ago. And I haven't eaten any meat since because I learned at that point that the depletion of the rainforest was creating a depletion of oxygen in our atmosphere and was not good for the world. So I got green then. But I thought that I would never get married. And I lived with a woman for seven years. And then I lived with another woman for five years. And that woman that I lived with, uh, marriage meant a lot to her. And because it meant a lot to her, and she meant a lot to me, I asked her to marry me, and we got married. And I think that 
is the biggest change thing in my life that has changed is my acceptance of that lifelong love affair of finding your soulmate and staying with your soulmate through thick and thin. And she's certainly stayed with me through thick and thin. We have three wonderful children mm. and, um, and, and she changed my mind about marriage and about a lifelong commitment. And because before that, I was 36 before I got married. Mm. And, I, and I thought, I'm never going to get married. It's not for me. So I think that was a big, big change in my life. Um, I don't know. That so what changed? Were you against the institution and, and, of marriage or just wasn't for you? Yeah. 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 I was a hippie and I thought that marriage was for the establishment, and for the man. And, and um, so it was just, uh, again, I was afraid of signing that little piece of paper. You know what's funny? About, you know what's funny about marriage? It's actually like living with somebody in Ontario. I don't know what it's like in the in the United States, but we have something called common law, right? Yeah, so we have you that. live you live with someone for six months in Ontario, and you're common law. Oh, and you wow! Have, I it's think it's six months. In the Scott. States. I think it's six months or a year. What is it, Scott? Uh, it's a year. Maybe a I year. only know this because I wow. put my taxes jointly with a roommate four times <laughs> so so it's a year which is not very long right no so a lot of people will live so what what happens is when you live common law if, if people make the same sacrifices as they maybe would in a marriage in terms of career or whatever they actually have the same rights in terms of uh you know access to your income alimony child support this kind of stuff sure um sure. what's interesting about the united states and canada is that there, there really isn't anything more clear to statisticians than the uh, difference between the wealth generation by those who are married and stay married and the uh, people that don't get married or get divorced. So uh, the number one generator of, like if you take statistics, for example, and I might be, I might be off like numbers wise, but I'm, I'm, I'm completely right on themes. So if you take like racial statistics in the United States and you say, well, I want you to show me all the black, the average, um, the average uh, uh, household income of an African-American family. Right. And you say, mm -hmm. show me the average household income of a Caucasian family or whatever. There's like mm -hmm. a 30 percent gap. But if you mm -hmm. if you say, take all the people that are married and show me the statistics of and assuming that, you know, African-Americans marry African-Americans and whatever. All the statistics that differentiate between income and race disappear. So um, African-Americans who get married to African-Americans and stay married have the same approximately the same household income as white Americans who marry white Americans and stay married. It's Good. interesting. But there, there's something about marriage, which is a wealth generator, that is not there for is not does not exist for people in common law relationships, and does not mm -hmm. exist for people that live singly. And I found that very that there actually is if you don't get married, your chances of becoming wealthy or becoming financially successful significantly go down. Um, as a, as a as a statistic, which is interesting. So there's something about that, and you changed your mind on it, and I guess it worked mm -hmm. out for you. But any other ideas that I think maybe that was, go ahead? Yeah, I beg your pardon. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. I think that I think that was the biggest change in my life. It really oh. was. I thought I was going to be single, uh, and had any plans in having children, but now that I've had children, I know the joys of having mm -hmm. children, and wow, I wouldn't have changed the thing. But and they changed the thing, and they stood by me, uh, of course, when I was going through my health issues, uh, and nobody was happier when I got that phone call and said, "Mr. Alcroft, we found your heart." <laughs> I bet they get to have their dad with yeah. them for another number of years, anyway. Exactly, pretty special day. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, indeed. Tell me a little bit about Mac Dryden and your relationship to him and how it was that you ended up uh, being having it was uh, uh, with Jay Leno on the Tonight Show. Was it? Jay yeah. Leno? Um, well, we did it with Johnny Carson and Jay Leno. Wow. Um, we um, I was a, a silversmith. I had apprenticed to a silversmith in Colorado 
Uh, I was living on a horse ranch and um, I started making silver jewelry and it became quite popular. And I was asked to open a store in Key West, Florida. And so someone sponsored me in a storefront on Wall Street in Key West and I made, you know, jewelry, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Stuff like that. Um, anyway, um, I had a successful silversmithing business and uh, I got kind of bored with it. And so I went to the local radio station and I said, you know, I do voices and impressions and so forth. And I can help you make your commercial sound really fun. Okay. And they said, well, how about you start tomorrow? I said, sure, that'd be great. They said, come <laughs> on in around 5.30. I said, 5.30? Around dinner time? They said, no, 5.30 in the morning. You're a new morning man. All of a sudden, I was the morning man on the rock and roll station in Key West, Florida. So I was the morning man for two and a half years. I got off the air one day, and there was a note waiting for me. And it said, you must be one of the funniest men in Key West. I'm the other one, <laughs> Mac Dryden. And so I went up to his, uh, his place, and I met him. And uh, we started writing comedy together. And we wrote some comedy reviews that we produced down in Key West. And then we started working at the, the uh, comic strip up at Fort Lauderdale. And all these young comics in 1980, all these young comics like uh, Carol Liefer and Jerry Seinfeld and Paul Reiser and Rick Overton, uh, they said, hey, you guys should go to New York. We went to New York. William Morris signed us. Within a year and a half of meeting, we did our first Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Oh. And then we did another Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. We, there was a show on in those days called Solid Gold. And we were the comedians on Solid Gold. And then we got our own TV series and ran for 125 episodes. And what was the TC TV series called? That's not in your bio. It was called Comedy Break. Comedy, Comedy Break with Mac and Jamie. You Comedy it's still Break. on YouTube floating around somewhere. Uh. Comedy Break with Mac and Jamie. We did 125 episodes. We had uh, Jan Hooks and Kevin Pollock as our, our sketch players on the show. And, um, man, we had fun. We had a blast. And Mac and I worked together for 40 years. And then we were both in our late 60s and kind of said, hey, you know, things are cool. Are you set? Yeah, I'm set. Okay, you set. Okay. So we retired. And he moved to Louisville, Kentucky. He was originally from Mississippi, and he's kind of a southern boy. So he moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and, and he's real happy. He's happier than a baby. And a, well, I can't say that, can I? Say uh, whatever you want. Happier and a baby and happier and a baby and a barrel full of boobies. Mm. I guess so. Happier and a cat on a liver wagon. And uh, so he lives in uh, Louisville now, and he walks along the Ohio River and collects driftwood and turns them into sculptures. And his wife's a very well-known uh, abstract artist. She has a show in L.A. As a matter of fact, next week we're going to go see. And he's a very happy man. Very happy man. And I'm happy he's happy. And we are probably one of the only comedy teams that broke up amicably. Uh, he said, hey, it's over. I said, yeah, no, it's over. It's okay. And uh, good luck. Love you, man. Love you, too. Did you As a matter of fact, I, I collected the uh, emails that we wrote to each other when we broke up. And I put those in my book because I thought it was so interesting that we broke up in such a wonderfully amicable, amicable fashion. Did you hug him? I, yeah, I think up? I did. Yeah, yeah, I think I did. Uh, appropriately, though. I, I hugged him appropriately. Uh, you know, belts, belt buckles, six inches apart. Slap in the back. That's it. And then you move away quickly. And then you disengage. <laughs> disengage. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll, if, if I, uh, I'll have to look around, see if I can find a video of a man hugging. I'll send it to you. Please do. I think that's a good note to close it out, Jamie. Thank you for coming on the Get a Grip oh, on Life podcast. Yeah. Uh, well, this was fun, man. It helped me get a grip. I hope it helped you get a grip. Sure, man. I enjoyed talking with you. And uh, Yeah, I enjoyed talking to you, too. Hey, I got to tell you, a little commercial. Uh, uh, if you're wandering around Toronto someday and you see that restaurant, Akira Back, okay. have you heard of it? No. Spell it for me. Unbelievable. A-K-I-R-A. Yeah. And the next word is B-A-C-K. You're a back. It's over by um, 
I don't know the name of the street, but it's over by Second City. Yeah. Okay. So it's down right downtown on down in that King Street district. There. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was great. My wife was in Toronto all winter. She was um, choreographing a new TV series for Netflix. Mm. She's an ice choreographer. Okay. She was a professional ice skater. She was born in uh, Montreal and grew up in Canada, in uh, Toronto, and went to the, uh, the cricket club. Sure. That's what it's yeah. called. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Osborne Colson was her coach. Her name's Sarah Kawahara, and she is a a world-renowned ice choreographer. So when Netflix got an ice show called Spinning Out, uh, Sarah had just choreographed I, Tanya with Margot Robbie, and uh, they hired her to go to Toronto. So I was back and forth out, in and out of Toronto all winter. I love that city. Wonderful city. That's yeah, a nice place. You know, it's, an, it's definitely a unique place in the world, Toronto. There's not a lot of cities it like It really Toronto. is. Yeah. Everybody lives in these high buildings and then they just drain out and do their thing and they go back into their high buildings at night it's it's curious toronto's changed a lot in the last 30 years a lot probably more than yes, i would say it's one of the most uh it's the, this, the amount of building that's gone on in toronto in the last 30 years is really incredible i mean i don't think oh, there's anything and it's like still it. going on yeah for you, sure you look at the skyline and all you see are cranes yeah, everywhere. Yeah, you know those cranes that they use for high, building high rises. Yeah, yeah. it's it's you know? crazy. Yeah, I mean it's really growing it very quickly. Yeah, uh, is there anything you want to tell the audience? Anything they can find book where they can find your book? Oh, uh, the Tin Man Diaries mm -hmm. is available on Amazon.com mm -hmm. for a scorching price of nine ninety nine US. I know it'll set you back, but it's worth it. And then um, what else is going on? Well, look for my daughter, Haley Kiyoko, and uh, watch for Spinning Out coming out on Netflix, eh? Done. It's going to be a good show. Jamie Alcroft, thanks for coming on the show. Michael, I really enjoyed talking to you, and uh, I hope everyone considers filling out that donor card and keeping people like me alive. I'm going to get after it right after the show. If you want to make some digital media, if you want to start a podcast, if you want to do something like that, go to getagripstudios.com. You can come in studio and use all my gear, or we can do it over the internet just like we did with Jamie Alcroft right now. Getagripstudios.com. Thanks for listening.